Today, we're talking about the state of coordinated vulnerability disclosure in Canada's federal government. Um, as mentioned, I am uh, I work at the Ryerson Leadership Lab and Cybersecurity Policy Exchange, which is a set of think tanks at Ryerson University. And we are so also, we are, you know, so lucky to have Mohan last time. So a professor of University of Ottawa, the Faculty of Law here with us today as well um, to answer questions later on, who you know offered much insight. We're also standing on the shoulder of giants. We have many people who whose work we're building off of, and we're also very I'm very honored just to, to be in this space. I love hackers. I kind of like consider my hacker my, uh, myself in some ways, um, and it's just really great to be here. Um, and Seth and I will toggle back and forth in terms of our sharing knowledge from today. So I'd like to start with a little story. Um, hoping my slides work. Yes, it's a tale of good faith Dutch hackers. Um, it's work. It's a uh, yeah. Well, we had you know in March 2008, um, universities in the Netherlands discovered smart cards were used for transit and government buildings around the globe. And um, I just want to make sure that folks can see my slides before I continue. I think that they're not updated. We can see them. Oh, excellent. Um, so university researchers in the Netherlands realized that these RFID smart card readers, you know, they were being used in government buildings around the globe and were being rolled up for use in transit across the Netherlands. You we're using a random number generator for encryption that was not random at all. So I include this little meme, you know, an old man saying, hey, we need a random number generator. And the guy in the corner is like, seven. And I feel like this is exactly how that random number generator was um, determined or decided upon by the people who made that smart card. So the hackers decided to inform the chipmaker NXP um, of the flaws that they found, as well as the Dutch government agencies um, involved, and they said that you know they said they wanted to find um, you know release those uh, those findings at an academic conference later that year, and they wanted to give them six months to to patch the flaws. Which um, interestingly enough, the Security Intelligence Agency in the Netherlands found reasonable. But in June 2008, NXP decided to sue the researchers. What did they want? They wanted a restraining order for their you know against the research publication despite the university researchers giving six months to patch. And what happened was in July, the Dutch court rejected the request to suppress the information, which is a really significant case. You know, that how they decided their, you know, their, 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 how they came to that decision was that they decided that their algorithm in question was not copyrighted, was never going to be made public by the researchers. They didn't see evidence of the criminal intent of the researchers and that therefore the justification on the limit of freedom of expression for these researchers was not you know, it hadn't met the threshold needed. Why it's significant? Well, we know that when you find vulnerabilities and you and you disclose them, that you actually can face significant legal repercussions for doing so. This is true across North America. We all know the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and how um, how overbroad it is, and how um, uh, how how it reaches into the you know the corners of hacker research, which and has a chilling effect on that research. So that was the question we wanted to know, is like, what is the Canadian government doing about this? This is such a significant topic. And this is building off work of my own on bug bounty programs. What we found in our work is that, you know, just as you can approach security with that mindset of opacity and obscurity, you believe that you hide something, therefore it's secure. We have uncovered that policy in Canada has a similar approach. So in Canada, what we've uncovered is that policymakers think that if they hide how they handle things, that that is making them secure. And by and large, what we see is three problems. First is that the Canadian federal government agencies don't appear to have guidelines or processes for vulnerability disclosure. So you find you know, a vulnerability in a website of Immigration Canada, or you find something um, that's a flaw in this, like, some sort of public facing um, system of the government, and there is no you know, clear way to disclose that. Hackers can still also face significant legal risk in Canada when they discover and, and disclose those flaws as well. And we also found that there isn't transparency as to how vulnerability information is treated. So you can disclose your vulnerabilities to an agency that we'll tell you about in a second or a few minutes. And it appears right now that the vulnerabilities can be withheld for potentially offensive purposes rather than being patched, which, which is a significant issue. So I'll pass it over to my colleagues. Yeah. Thank you, Yuan. So let's clarify what we mean when we say coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Now, vulnerability disclosure is when information about a vulnerability is provided to a party that's likely unaware of it. 
There's varying options when it comes to disclosure. Non-disclosure is when all vulnerability information is kept private between the reporter and the system provider, so the vulnerability is never made public. Public disclosure can be done fully or partially, where some or all of the information known about the vulnerability is disclosed publicly before a patch has been made to fix the vulnerability. Now, what makes coordinated vulnerability disclosure different from just vulnerability disclosure is that it allows a middle ground to be reached between non-disclosure and full disclosure, where the finder and the system provider come to an agreement that the system provider will provide a patch, and until that patch is deployed, or until an agreed upon time has been passed, the finder will keep the vulnerability information private. Once the vulnerability has been addressed, then the finder can publish information regarding the vulnerability that they found. So considering this coordinated vulnerability disclosure, or CVD, it encompasses principles such as reducing harm, presuming benevolence of security researchers, avoiding surprises on behalf of all parties, incentivizing ethical desired behavior, improving disclosure, disclosure processes, and recognizing that vulnerability disclosure is a wicked problem. It isn't something with straightforward and perfect solutions because it's a multifaceted issue. Now, uh, you've probably heard us repeatedly say the term finder or disclosure, and that's one of the key actors when it comes to CVD. It's the person who is reporting the vulnerability that they found. There's also the system provider who creates or maintains the product that is vulnerable. The, there's also the deployer who's in charge of deploying the patch or handling other remediation efforts, and the coordinator who facilitates the response process. Now, with respect to time, I'm not going to delve into each of the CVD processes or phases, but as you can see here, there are different stages of the CVD process from discovery up until public disclosure. Now, in terms of risks of implementing CVD programs, well, first and foremost, the organization needs to already have strong cybersecurity infrastructure. Otherwise, they'll be inundated with many duplicate reports which can in turn make them unable to provide consistent and adequate communication with all of the reporters, subsequently leading to frustrations. There's also the risk that information will leak to the public before a patch has been deployed and the risk of the vulnerability being exploited. And also there's the risk that organizations and companies could be using their CVD policies as hype or marketing to simply improve their reputations rather than having interest in actually improving their vulnerability disclosure processes. Now, also, there's a whole host of benefits of CVD, and that includes the fact that software is always going to contain flaws, which may be missed during the development and testing phases. CVD policies also provide legal clarification, they help build hacker goodwill and trust, and they make the triage and repair processes much more clear for all parties involved. Okay, off to you, UN. Thanks so much, Steph. Um, yeah, we, you know, there's so much that is good and um, that can come out of um, coordinated vulnerability disclosure programs. And there's also another thing I might add to the risk um, related to vulnerability disclosure that comes external from the external um, sort of environment. And one of those things is the labor implications of paying people to find flaws. So you treat hackers as workers, but maybe they don't have, ha you know, the rights of workers. And that's something that a report that um, will be coming out this year that I've worked on uh, looks at in further depth. In terms of coordinated vulnerability disclosure generally though, we wanted to sort of identify some of the best practices that are emerging. We decided to, well, we actually, we didn't decide to, but we uncovered in our research on this topic that the Netherlands and the US seem to be leading the way in this area. What we've uh, discovered is that the Dutch approach to coordinated vulnerability disclosure is really marked by guidelines versus, you know, legally binding regulation or um, laws in general on this topic, and the need to consider good faith, which means the intention of the hacker and discloser. So what we found is that the National Security uh, Center in um, the Netherlands, uh, the Cybersecurity Center that is, which operates from the ministry, you know, out of the Ministry of Justice there, encourages but does not require that organizations and presumably agencies have coordinated vulnerability disclosure policies. And this is, you'll see in a second how this stands in contrast to what's uh, what the case in the U.S. The, you know, the National Cybersecurity Center also acts as an intermediary if the organization's response is inadequate. So let's say you disclose a flaw you find in Microsoft systems, but um, it's an Outlook. Uh, it, 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 you know, it's found in Outlook and the government uses Outlook for email. 
um, if Microsoft doesn't respond in a way that is appropriate, then the National Cybersecurity Center in the Netherlands could act as an intermediary and help make sure that that um, vulnerability is patched. What's also really important is that, you know, they have through these guidelines and through a policy letter, clarification around the expectations and obligations for all parties. And as you see, if you check out this coordinated vulnerability disclosure guideline, um, which we've analyzed in the course of our research, we've identified that the National Cybersecurity Center in the Netherlands actually sets out what they expect of hackers. So they say, don't do social engineering. Don't um, engage in distributed debt denial of service uh, attacks. And they also, you know, on the other hand, say what they will be um, obligated to do because of their promises to hackers. They promise to respond within certain amounts of time. They promise to patch the flaw. They promise to work with the hacker who discloses the flaw to decide when to publish um, and how to publish the information that's been disclosed. Um, and in terms of law, before the prosecutor in the Netherlands lays, lays criminal charges, they must consider the intention, proportionality, and what's called the subsidiarity principle before those charges are laid. So they consider you know, what the hacker intended to do. They consider um, the impacts of the disclosure in comparison to the harm, for example. And they also consider, did the hacker disclose to the most immediately affected institution or entity without disclosing to a broader group of people? Um, basically, did they disclose to only the people who were affected? by the system. Let's contrast this to the US federal approach where what we see in, in contrast to the Holland or Netherlands approach really is regulation. It's more heavy handed. So there's requirements around having vulnerability disclosure policies. And there's somewhat of a reduction of legal risk. But as you can see, it's very different than what is occurring in the Netherlands when it comes to vulnerability disclosure. So as of March 1st, all federal agencies have been required to run their own vulnerability disclosure programs um, and policies, which is hugely significant. Um, it's really been since 2016 that uh, federal agencies have started on an ad hoc basis in the U.S. context, you know, but implementing their own vulnerability disclosure policies, including paid programs. But the fact that now all federal agencies are required um, by the Communications and Infrastructure Security Agency to have those VDPs is really significant. And there have also been questions raised around, are these agencies, you know, um, is there you know, adequate sort of personnel and resources to handle that? And that's been a question raised, but this is, this is like the, the US approach to vulnerability disclosure at the federal level. Uh, in 2017 as well, the US Department of Justice stated that the existence of a vulnerability disclosure um, policy substantially reduces the likelihood of being found liable under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, and there was also uh, a, a, a sort of guideline released saying that if in 2016, saying that if you um, circumvented the DMCA, the D D Digital Millennium Copyright Act, while engaging in um, hacking activities such that you circumvented the security measures of a copyrighted um, set of materials, then you could potentially be exempt from the applicability of copyright law. But it's very true, and I build on the work of Amit Elazari's work to say that significant legal risks remain in the US context. I wanted to also show you what we've uncovered in our work on how hacking or how law applies to hacking in Canada. We're building on the research of others who've written about um, this topic as well. And I don't wanna go through each slide in particular or each row that is because, um, you know, feel free to screenshot it. And I, because I encourage you to um, keep your eyes peeled for a report that we'll be authoring and be publishing in the next month or so on this topic, which will lay this out in more depth. But as you can see, when you engage in hacking, including unsolicited security or penetration testing, this could invoke um, aspects of the criminal code related to unauthorized use of a computer, um, fraud, mischief, or willf willfully destroying or damaging property. Um, in one case, actually labeled what had happened, causing chaos, um, willful interception of private communications. Um, also other activity involving the data of the computer can also trigger, I know, unauthorized use of computer data. If you if you engage in social engineering, that could be seen as identity theft or fraud. Possessing and even using the devices made for hacking can be seen as um, in contravention of the criminal code. And then you also have the Copyright Act, which is applicable when you are circumventing security measures, including decryption for copyrighted materials. What we haven't yet um, fully finished researching in our work as well is the implications of privacy law, civil law, um, including data protection law. And even elections law actually pertains to hacking in Canada and you know, makes this activity quite legally risky. Finally, um, for this part of the um, talk, 
in terms of legal risks, I want to build on the work of our professor, um, or the professor at our behest, Wilhelm Matan Benito, who uncovered that there are 40 plus laws across Canada that protect whistleblowers. And the reason why I bring this up is because you, you look at Edward Snowden and you think, you know, what law could have protected him in the, in the acts that he engaged in? And he was coming not from the inside the government, but for a contractor. And, you know, you think that whistleblower protection law would apply. The TLDR is that whistleblower, whistleblower protection law is like, doesn't really protect a person who's going to disclose a flaw um, found in the federal government systems. And there's a few reasons. This, only a few of these laws can protect security researchers in the first place. And these criteria have to be met. So the person would disclose an issue that violates a law. That's a pretty high threshold. So it's not, you know, the potential that a law is violated. It's, it's not even like that this person's data can be stolen. It's that the law has to be violated um, or would violate a law. And the person has to be an employer contractor of the organization, which means that there's limitations upon who can disclose from the outside. And then the disclosure has to be made to a higher level officer or specific governmental agency, which means you can't disclose to the public, except when... Um, there's an immediate risk to public health, safety, or to the environment, and the, the time constraints involved pre prevent the use of regular internal mechanisms for disclosure. Also, what's notable is that data protection law or and or privacy law, depending on how you decide to label it, can provide some measure of whistleblower protection law for um, breaches of data, but this is only the case in um, provinces excluding Quebec. Um, and that's really significant um, limitation as well and deficit in law. So I'll pass it over to Steph as well for this next little bit. Thanks, Yuan. Now, in terms of Canada's approach to coordinated vulnerability disclosure, there's currently no clear policy framework in Canada regarding security research. At present, if you find any vulnerabilities on systems owned by the Canadian federal government, there is no straightforward path for you to disclose it nor any clear indication as to how the vulnerability would be remediated. Typically, com computer emergency readiness teams and computer security incident response teams, otherwise known as CERTs or CERTs, um, are groups that help handle cybersecurity incidents and vulnerabilities. Canada's official national CERT used to be separate from the government, but it has now been absorbed by the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity, aka CCCS, which is managed by the Communication Security Establishment. Now, the CCCS's website, it allows you to report cyber incidents, but not necessarily vulnerabilities. Looking here at the definition of cyber incident, it appears to only involve wrongdoing or potential for wrongdoing. Since the discovery of a vulnerability is a discovery of a condition which may give rise to a cyber incident, then it can be interpreted that the CCCS does not actually facilitate the disclosure of vulnerabilities per se. Now, something interesting is that after revisiting archived versions of the CCCS's website, we discovered that they made a major update just last week. Before this update, there was simply a contact page with a general email address for sending reports. Now, the website's reporting mechanism is a bit more streamlined. It guides people to different reporting processes based on the type of actor that they are. Even so, the fundamental aspects of coordinated vulnerability disclosure are missing. The CCCS still does not promise that vulnerabilities reported to them would be disclosed to the impacted agencies or system providers, nor that they would work on mitigating those vulnerabilities. Now, this is a concern because Canada's handling of vulnerabilities is quite secretive, especially compared to its global peers like the US, UK, and Australia. Unlike those countries, Canada's processes for deciding, for deciding whether or not to disclose or hide vulnerability information for national defensive and offensive use is not known to the public. This procedure is called different things. In the US, they call it their vulnerabilities equities process. In the UK, they call it the equities process. But regardless, all that we know is that the CSC has a framework for this decision-making process, and it involves experts from the CCCS. But otherwise, uh, there's very little known about how they decide whether to disclose or hide vulnerability information. Now, moving on, here are our tips for vulnerability discovery and disclosure. And please take note that this is a gray area. So we are not, and what we are stating is not legal advice. Now, when discovering vulnerability, disclose that information to the organization or system provider that owns or manages the software and or the government agency that is involved with the product. And also understand the rules of the game, taking into account what types of activity is allowed and what the legal responsibilities are. 
do absolutely only what is needed to demonstrate the vulnerability's existence. And lastly, do not publicly disclose the vulnerability information until after the agreed upon timeframe or after the vulnerability has been remediated. Throwing it back to you, Yuan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you've highlighted the deficits in uh, uh, vulnerability disclosure, um, Canada's approach to vulnerability disclosure. Um, and it's nice to have some tips, um, but again, we cannot provide legal advice for obvious reasons. Um, and we have to say that. <laughs> so we also want to let you know and give you a sneak peek as to what we're recommending for the gov to the government of Canada. Um, and why we're doing this research, just to give you some context, is that, you know, this is a topic I'm, I'm extremely interested in. And we got some, um, we were able to get some funding from uh, the Department of National Defense, who I guess was also interested in this topic, particularly, you know, vulnerability disclosure and, and how does the government handle that? What that means is that we're going to be making recommendations to the government of Canada. Of course, they might, you know, these recommendations might fall on deaf ears, but we'll be making them nonetheless, and we hope that these changes are made. First of all, we think that Canada's federal, federal agencies need vulnerability disclosure procedures that follow best practices. Um, best practices include like deciding who's eligible and making that clear. Some um, US uh, vulnerability disclosure programs actually limited who could participate in them based on their citizenship and based on if they had received, received security clearance. Um, if that's the case, then that's extremely important to be, um, uh, you know, to be uh, transparent about. And then we'll be diving into whether or not that is the, the norm as well in our report. Um, it's also really important, for example, and that's just one of the many best practices out there, but um, we'll be, we'll be uh, advising the government on that. And then it's also really important to, just, to keep disclosed vulnerabilities separate from the equities, quote unquote, management framework. What that means is that if you disclose a vulnerability to the Canadian federal government, it should not be the case that a branch of the intelligence agency is able to withhold that information for potential offensive use. Um, there's a few reasons for that. The most obvious is that um, if a person knows of a vulnerability and um, the government decides to withhold that, it actually puts the government systems at more risk than if they were to actually patch that. And this is the case in the US and in the UK. These are the um, jurisdictions where they explicitly say that if you disclose vulnerabilities to them, they won't be part of that framework where maybe um, a military agency or the intelligence agency can withhold that information for their purposes. We also believe it's really important to disclose information about the vulnerability that the public wasn't repaired, um, again, for obvious reasons. And this is just an emerging best practice that we think Canada needs to learn from. And you know, it's clear that Canada needs a legal and policy framework for vulnerability disclosure, just as as they have it in the Netherlands and in the US, it's, um, it's really important that there be clarity around when the you know, anti-hacking law applies to Canada and when you can um, consent to um, engaging in activity that would uh, you know, exist outside of the, the framework of you being um, guilty of doing something, for example, simply because you uh, did something that constitutes hacking activity. Um, so so here are those uh, sort of best practices as mentioned. We think it's really important to be clear around eligibility, the submission and verification process. So, you know, how it, we, I've heard in the course of my research that you can submit a flaw um, and then the entity will say, oh, this is actually not a flaw, but then they decide to patch that anyway. So if that's the case, A, well, organizations should not be doing that. And um, they actually need to be clear about how they decide to validate um, the flaws and the information um, and the reports they find. There also should be some restrictions and clear expectations around what can be hacked on, so in terms of scope, and then what is also allowable in terms of hacking activity. So um, there's a list of, of things you cannot do when you engage in the vulnerability disclosure processes in the UK, in, um, in the Netherlands, in the US, such as you can't engage in social engineering, you can't engage in DDoS attacks, for example. It's also an emerging best practice to find um, to give credit and recognition to people who disclose flaws because that incentivizes them to do that. Of course, there are risks around creating a sort of market for flaws when you pay people, but that's something to consider and of course the risks that come with that. And then of course, public awareness is a really important best practice that has emerged in the course of our work. Um, so please keep your eyes peeled for a report and we're happy to give um, take your feedback. You can reach us at email, um, the email listed below um, and you can find them online. And we are excited to answer your questions in the Q&A period.
Thank you for your time, everyone.